Wizards. Hello, YouTube. I'm Dev from The Place. What's up, Wizards? And hello, say hello to chat while you're here. Chat, say hello to YouTube. Uh, we're looking at mom cards that got spoiled over the weekend. Two of them, to be exact. You don't get much. <laughs> you don't get much. And there's no way that you can see this image. There is just absolutely no way that you can see this. That's much better. Look at that. Can I go all the way with it? Yeah, you can, Dev. All right. That's much better. Okay. Hi, YouTube. We're going to talk about some uh, some magic cards. Just a couple from Mom. That's all we got, but they're both Planeswalkers. One of them is fine, and the other one is good. So let's look, let's look at the fine one first, I guess. <laughs> you know? This is Archangel Elspeth. Elspeth's back. Uh, people are freaking out about that, I guess. <laughs> I think Elspeth's cool, but that's not why I like magic cards. I like them because of the text on them. Let's see what she does. Four mana, two and two white mana for a four loyalty planeswalker. You can plus one Elspeth. Create a one one white soldier creature token with lifelink. If you minus two easy E, you put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. It becomes an angel in addition to its other types and it gains flying. You can minus six Elspeth to return all non land permanents with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So that's a pretty nifty little ultimate there. I was just saying how I wish like aristocrats or something like that had a decent finisher like Rally the Ancestors. And this is reminiscent of Rally the Ancestors on the ultimate. And it takes three turns to get to. That's not forever. <laughs> like the whole time you're making soldiers. The soldiers have lifelink. It looks like somewhat decent <laughs> against aggro is just like a mid-range thing that creates tokens every turn. That's not bad. We've got multiple walkers in standard that plus to make tokens. This reminds me of Jaya and plus to make a 1-1, one, one, basically, with a keyword ability. Um, so I kind of like that about it. And I don't mind the minus two either. I've seen people saying like the minus two is not that big of a deal. But two plus one plus one counters makes almost any creature like somewhat hefty. The flying, huge freaking deal. The flying, huge freaking deal. Um, I also like how it doesn't get a flying token. Do you note that? Do you see that? It just gains flying. Just gains flying. Not a flying token. Interesting. But in any case, you could put this in like an angel's deck. I think it's probably not where you want to be. I think it becoming an angel in addition to its other types is just flavor for the most part. But altogether, it's a decent walker. But it's not a Texas Ranger. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> If I had to assign a number grade to this, it would be like a seven and a half. If I had to assign a letter grade to it, it would be like a C... Plus, you know what I mean? <laughs> so maybe a C plus. That doesn't mean it's bad though. You know, sometimes when I assign grades to cards, people go just absolutely nuts because they don't know how grades work or they, like they think that a seven is bad. But no, it's a playable card. Um, a C plus is a playable magic card. It's just got to find the right spot. Right now, that this is a, a little bit uh, in in a bad a bad way <laughs> in terms of finding a spot in your curve because it's on the same spot as the Wandering Emperor, which is just a better card. So it's possible that this uh, has to wait a minute to see some play, but it's also possible. This slots right in as like a one of in the mono white deck, which is also already a force in standard and doesn't have like all of the four drops that it, in the world. You know what I mean? It's got Wandering Emperor. Sometimes you see Sarah Paragon. There's a couple of other cards in those slots. But for the most part, I think that you could make a case that the mono white deck can open up some slots for one copy of Archangel Elspeth and just become more of a Planeswalker deck. You know, like four Wandering Emperor, one or two Archangel Elspeth at the most, and then like two Eternal Wanderers. And now, you're a Walker's deck, which plays well with uh, Farewell, you know, if you're going to play Farewell in that deck anyway. Then it's nice to have a few Walkers, and once you do hit Farewell, this becomes like pretty good, you know. If you just plus one it, and then, you know, the next turn put, you know, two plus one plus one counters on the one one you just made. And now you got a 3-3 flying lifelink. Like, that's not bad either, you know? I imagine that even though it's 4 mana at sorcery speed, this can come down in end games on occasion because it can just give a relatively big dude flying and make it even bigger, you know? So if you need to punch through for that last, like, 6 damage, you know? And you got a 4-4 four four that otherwise wouldn't be able to get through. You're wrecking her bank buster. Just crew the bank buster, 2 counters on it, gains flying, let's go, I win, you know? So... And again, the white deck plays for Reckoner Bankbuster like nine times out of ten. So it's also kind of interesting, like with Ambitious Farmhand and like other cards that deck plays. You know, with Farmhand, suddenly it got you the planes, it did its job, but it's also a 3 3 flyer. Uh, some of your opponent might have to worry about, especially post depopulate, post farewell. So, like, I think that there are situations where this card gets set up like really, really well in the mono white deck. So. 
I see people saying this card's kind of like ho-hum, and blah, 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 and I kind of just did the same thing. But the card definitely has one deck that is interested in slotting it, like, directly in. So, I think anytime you add a color, you probably don't want to... <laughs> like, I add black, oh, I have Shieldred, you know, and I have other black four drops on it. Soren might be even a better Planeswalker than this if you're going to play Planeswalker in the four drop slot. And you have access to, like, black, so... I think just the mono white deck wants it, but that deck might want it a good bit. It needs another, and I know it sounds weird to say this, but that deck kind of does need another solid creature factory. One thing you don't want to miss here either is that not only can it put the counters on Bankbuster and have it gain flying and stuff, but it can get the it can put the counters on an ambitious farmhand, and now the farmhand can crew a Bankbuster. It can make a soldier and then minus two to put the counters on the soldier, and now the soldier can crew the Bankbuster. So, again, these are lines that matter. They matter a good bit. Um, Spirit, what is it, um, Spirited Companion, put the counters on a companion, tap to crew the bank buster, so, I don't know, that could be actually all, like, really good stuff, I just like the way this kind of lines up in Mono White, I don't have a lot more to say about it, honestly, I am trying to say as much as I want to about it, because we only have to talk about two cards in this, in this spoiler section, right, but I think there is more to say about this than sort of people have been, I think it fits in pretty well, but it's not too exciting outside of the flavor. It just looks like a normal Planeswalker, but I think some of the wrinkles, you know, creature gains flying. Um, the fact that, again, if you go depopulate into this, into Farewell, for instance, you know, if you just go depopulate, they play a guy, you know, you play Archangel Elspeth, make a blocker, block that guy, next turn, Farewell. I think you're probably doing okay, um, you know, and then you just plus one the Elspeth again to get it going. And at that point, again, you're set up on a board where you can start giving the soldiers plus one, plus one counters, flying, get through. Your opponent has to basically immediately answer this. Even if they can start removing the creatures involved and stuff, your Elspeth is getting this massive loyalty. And if you are able to uh, get to that, then again, you get your Spirited Companions, Ambitious Farmhands, Restoration of Iganjo. Um, Reckoner Bank Busters, your Fable of the Mirror Breaker, you know, just all this stuff back from your graveyard, so long as you didn't farewell your graveyard away or whatever. So, like, all that is really good, I think. I think that, again, when you set this up, it gets to ultimate pretty quickly. And the Mono White deck plays a fair number of things it could actually get out of its graveyard. But, again, the wrinkle there is that this, you know, Mono White does not care usually about farewelling their own graveyard away, but this might make them change their prerogative on that. So, again, there's some cool stuff here. There's some cool stuff. Yeah, so you are not farewelling your graveyard with this Planeswalker. Nope. Nope. You've, the Mono White deck finally has a reason to care about its graveyard, you know? So, I think that might actually matter, too. It's just all around. Cool card, man. I think it's I think it's nice. Uh, but again, I would give it like a C+. Plus just because its, it's application is... Somewhat narrow. It, it could go in the deck that I kind of want to play tonight on stream, the Boros Tokens deck, and probably just be great in that deck again. Get your Urbrass Forge, your Fable of the Mirror Breaker, your Wedding Announcement, all those things come back. Like, yeah. And honestly, I think there's an argument between this and Sarah Paragon. Paragon is like this in terms of the ultimate. You know, it's got the exact same casting cost too. So if you want to play Paragon, you play it, you untap with it and play, and you immediately get something back from your graveyard. Um, that costs three. So long as you don't have something better to play from your hand or whatever. It takes all your mana. So, I think those two cards are fighting a little bit, but ultimately this is probably better than Sarah Paragon. Now, this doesn't swing for three with lifelink immediately, but it will swing for three with lifelink. I guess Paragon doesn't have lifelink, but it will swing for three flying <laughs> and lifelink, so that's a big deal. Like, it doesn't have a three-four body like Paragon does, but... I mean, it makes a bunch of power toughness by plusing. It makes power toughness by minusing. You know, it breaks through with flying. It gives a, the Sarah Paragon ability to, to multiple creatures over the course of the game. Almost no matter what the board state is, this has a reason to be on the table. So, I like it, man. I think it's a solid card. But, again, probably just in that one deck. But Boris Tokens becomes a thing. This could be in the deck. But anyway, let's move on to the card that everyone's really talking about the last couple of days. I think that another reason people aren't talking as much about Elspeth's function, people are talking about the flavor, but not the function, is uh, because this card exists and just looks better. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Ren and Realm Breaker here. This is three mana, one and two green, for a 4-4 four, four legendary planeswalker, Ren. 
It's got a chromatic lantern ability. <laughs> Lands you control have tap, add a mana of any color. It also has plus one. Up to one target land you control becomes a 3-3 three, three elemental creature with vigilance, hexproof, and haste until your next turn. It's still a land. Minus two. Mill three cards. You may put a permanent card from among the milled cards into your hand. Minus seven. You get an emblem with. You may play lands and cast permanent spells from your graveyard. Earlier, I had someone on Twitter say that this is by far the best emblem. I don't want to misquote them, but I'm, it's going to turn out to be a paraphrase. Like by far the most impactful or by far just generally the best emblem that they've ever created. And my response, I was like, by far? <laughs> Question mark? Like, by that? That ahead of everything else? Because um, I'm just not sure about that. Uh, cast permanent spells from your graveyard's nuts, obviously. The good thing about this is that if you get the emblem, and the emblem sends the realm, the wren to your graveyard, or your opponent kills the wren after you get the emblem, then you just play the wren out of your graveyard. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cute. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it does create the sort of deck building cost. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. I want to point that out. Um, but it does create the deck building cost that you want most of the things in your deck to be permanents. Right? Um, I do think that that is some opportunity cost, at the very least. Not much. But, you know, Shigeki decks. Shigeki can only get back non-legendary permanents, but... Shigeki decks will still play legendary permanence, you know, <laughs> so it's not like just because this thing's emblem, which will only get to one out of 20 games or whatever, um, is, is so reliable that you need to not have instance in your deck or whatever. I don't think that's the case. Um, not at all. But I do think the emblem is very powerful. And if you get it, being able to cast, you know, planeswalkers or creatures or enchantments out of your yard is good, but you do have to pay the mana for them. I want to point that out. You do have to pay the mana for them. Um, you can't just like put them into play or whatever, but still it gives you something to do every single turn emblems at the moment can't be interacted with. So it is obviously an extremely powerful ultimate, but obviously the ultimate's not usually why you talk about a planeswalker and this one takes four turns to get to, right? You know, the turn it comes into play and then it goes to six and then seven and then the next turn <laughs> you can finally ultimate it. This one, I will say you don't mind ultimating it to kill it, right? Cause you just play it again. Who cares? But <laughs> anyway. Uh, land you control have tapped out of mana of any color. That's cute. Um, and probably is more than cute, to be honest. Uh, I like that this can go in multicolored decks, but there's a little bit of a cost there. You have to have like 15 to eight, really is 18 uh, green sources in your deck to reliably cast this on turn three at like 90%. Consult the Karsten curve if you don't know what I'm talking about. But you can have 15 green sources in your deck and cast this on turn three at about 80%. And that is not a great ratio, so you have to have a lot of green in your deck. Um, so is this the return of a deck that no one except us very old timers remember? Five color green from like 1997. Um, <laughs> I doubt it, right? But we have seen a lot of decks, mostly courtesy of Birds of Paradise, in the past that have been base green, because they need an untapped green source on turn one to cast birds, right? But they play all five colors. Um, this needs two green sources on three, which is a pretty heavy commitment to green. It is. Um, that's the thing you have to, to, to remember, but land you control have tapped out of mana of any color means that you want to play, you know, three colors at least, something like that, just to take advantage as much as possible of this. Also, I think this is cute, a little wrinkle here that people aren't talking about, is that lands that would normally not even tap for mana, like a Maze of Ith or something, you know, lands like that, um, can now tap for mana. I think it's cute. Um, and lands that would tap for colorless and no other color, they can now tap for mana. I think that's neat. Dark Depths can tap for mana. You know? <laughs> All that's cute, but add a mana of any color, just the lazy, lazy auto tapper ability um, is, a, is a very good line of text, especially to have on a three drop. It goes up to five loyalty the turn it comes out. That's not Oko or anything, but it is a lot of loyalty the turn it comes out. But you're incentivized to play it on turn four. And on turn four, a five loyalty planeswalker is normal. It's not so bad, right? Um, also, you can, on turn four, you play it, right? The play everyone's talking about. The play I'm sure the people told, talked about on Twitter, on Reddit. I'm sure people are in the chat mentioning it right now. <laughs> the play everyone's freaking out about is that you play this on four. You have a land up. You turn that land into a creature. 
with Hexproof, which we'll get to that. But you turn that land into a creature that is now up to block and can also tap to cast a Cut Down or Fading Hope or Play With Fire. Or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Any number of instant speed, one mana, usually removal spells are used in this example. And that's good. That seems like a pretty good line. Um, I'm not sure that it's much better. If you're, if you're, again, if you're doing this on turn four, I'm not sure that it's much better than holding up Wandering Emperor. Of course, um, when I compare a card to one of the best cards in standard... <laughs> That's that's good. <laughs> For, that means the card might be good. But if I had the choice in my hand, if I'm looking at Ren and Realmbreaker, Wandering Emperor, and it's turn four, I'm probably holding up the Emperor. Probably. Depends on the board state, but I would imagine 70% of the time. I'm going to hold up the Emperor. Um, but there's that. If you play this on three, it goes up to five, so the likelihood they swing into it and kill it is actually pretty low. I'll give you that much. Um... The lands only become creatures until your next turn. That's a little lame. It does mean you can block with them, so there is that. And they can't be interacted with. They have Hexproof. That is super important. They also have Vigilance, by the way, which means that you can turn a land into a creature, attack with Vigilance, and still block with it. Still cast spells. That's sweet. That is very sweet. Um, but the Hexproof is the most important part of this because usually you would say... Well, a downside of these green planeswalkers that turn lands into creatures is that the creatures can die, right? The, <laughs> your opponent now can just lightning strike your land, and that's land destruction. They cast Stone Rain for two mana at instant speed <laughs> and kill one of your lands and one of your creatures at the same time. That's not going to happen with this. Hexproof, I think, is maybe the most important word on this entire card. There are going to be times, however... I think that there may be, I pause it, there may be a lot of times where you plus this just to plus it. You don't plan on blocking the graveyard trespasser or the corpse appraiser with your land. You don't plan on doing that. Um, maybe you do. I think there is something to be said for the fact that 3-3 three, three is an important stat line in standard right now because of corpse appraiser, <laughs> because of especially graveyard trespasser. I will also say that, like, the land dies to Reckoner Bankbuster swinging it. Um, the land trades with Blood Tithe Harvester. Is that good or bad? <laughs> you know, is trading good or bad in this situation? There's not a lot of two twos that's just brick walls, unless you're talking about mono red. Um, even soldiers can can get past you know this level of pt without really caring too much it does these lands do very interestingly block a thalia and kill her but if they play thalia on turn two you have to hold off until turn four to play Ren in realm breaker and then you can't you know have an untapped land and they just kill it <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm not sure how good it is against soldiers especially if they do t2 thalia um so there's that but in any case, 3-3 three, three is an important stat line right now because it trades with a bunch of important creatures. Uh, but there's also Bankbuster, Shildred, Phyrexian Obliterator, and all these things that you are not going to block or attack into. So you're just going to be plussing it to plus it some of the times. And that just doesn't feel very good. You know, at that point, I would rather plus uh, Elspeth and get a 1-1 lifelink that can actually block. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so... I'm just, I, I, I want the first ability to be great, and I think Hexproof makes it much better. I want to say, speculation here, obviously, wild speculation, but I want to say they tried this without the Hexproof, and it just was not good. <laughs> so, they slap Hexproof, now you can choose whether or not to block or attack or whatever, um, and your land's never going to get blown away. You make the choice to lose that land every time, and that's good. Um, the minus two is a very good ability. Uh, the minus two is an intensely good ability. This is yet another one that prioritizes you putting permanence in your deck. So this one, more than the ultimate, I think, will prioritize people maybe not playing as many cut downs, you know what I mean? Um, or or faithful, uh, fading hopes and stuff that you can cast for one mana. When you leave, you know, when you play, when you play this on four and leave a land untapped. Um, you won't completely deny yourself those plays. You won't. But again, when this is your minus two, you really, that incentivizes playing permanence, right? So, um, somebody compared this, I think jokingly, <laughs> somebody replied to me on Twitter and compared this to dig through time, <laughs> which is cute. You do, it, without plussing it at all, 
And if it doesn't get swung into, you technically, theoretically, get to do the minus two twice and look at six cards and get the, the best two permanents from the top six. Uh, that's great. <laughs> seems, seems pretty good, you know. And you're milling to itself mill, which plays into the ultimate or any other, you know, planeswalkery or not planeswalker, but like, you know, graveyard milkshakey and bringing your boys to the yard kind of stuff that you're doing. Plays in well there. And I like milling yourself a lot. You know that about me. <laughs> but at the same time, I think the best part of this card is the fact that it costs three mana. That's it. I will also say that this card does a lot of things. It didn't have to have a passive, and they slapped what appears to be a fairly impactful passive on the guy. You know, it's not a bad one. <laughs> not at all. So they, they gave it a passive it didn't have to have. It's only three mana. It goes up to five on turn three. However, of course, if you want to play it on four, that's when you get the most value out of it, potentially, and blah, 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 but still. Um, which is tension. I like tension in a card, but it makes cards a little harder to evaluate, and it makes people sort of blind to what they're proposing, I think, some of the time, because, again, everyone who's saying play this on turn four, well, you're negating some of the advantage of the fact that it's three Metal Planeswalker, which is the number one thing that it has going for it uh, at that point. We're probably going to see some cheeky memes with this and, like, Invoke Despair, you know? It's like <laughs> the three different Invokes deck with Ren and Realm Breaker because now I can just do whatever I want. So there's that that could be fun. But ultimately, I think there is... Even though the, the card, I want to be very clear, the card is very good. The card is good. I am not saying the card is bad. I think people will hear that when I say this. But I do think the card is uh, being currently overvalued. Um... But, but, and I, I again, I, I have to be crystal clear because people seem to hear whatever they want some of the time. <laughs> I have to be crystal clear. Even if I think people are overvaluing the card, that is in an environment right now where everyone is freaking out <laughs> about this card. So even if I don't think it's as good as people think it is, I still think the card is extremely good. Very good. Um, you know, I called this card a, what, a B plus or something on Twitter, something like that. And people, maybe I said it a B minus, <laughs> but one way or the other, a B is good. Like a, a, an 80 something, you know, a B is a more than solidly playable card in standard. A B is a card that we'll see play in multiple decks in standard, but not, I think in the end being, end up being anything we have to like outright ban. I just, I don't think so. So ultimately I don't think the sky is falling. I don't think that this is like the new reincarnation of Oko. And I've seen people like unironically compare the card to Oko. And it just isn't that. It's not. <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, when you look at the things that you typically want from a planeswalker, does it protect itself? Yes, but only if you play it on four. And sometimes only if you're willing to trade one of your lands. Very important resource. <laughs> right? Um, does it kill creatures? Does it, does it affect the board state by taking, you know, permanence off of the board? No, it doesn't do that at all. Does it draw cards? Yes, it does. But at the cost of a hefty amount of loyalty and you can't just draw a card. You can't just get whatever you want. It has to be a permanent. Sometimes you're going to get, you know, cut down land, land. That's just not very good, <laughs> but I guess you can play the land and then make a creature out of it next turn. Whatever. <laughs> yes, but I'm just not as nuts about it as I think a lot of people are, but I want you to keep in mind that if I if I give this card a B right now, that is that is me saying, not this card is bad, I'm gonna doo-doo on it. I'm gonna pull my trousers down and go doo-doo. No. Look, I'm, me, <laughs> me giving it a B is saying this card will show up in multiple standard decks uh, without actually being like a problem card or anything. It's also not an A because it's not like the card in the deck, you know, it's, it's not, I'm, I might eat my words on that one and say, it's not fable of the mirror breaker. You know, it's not the wandering emperor. It isn't, it isn't. Um, and so note here that if the card ends up seeing standard play and people say it's good, um, that's what I said. <laughs> that's what that's what I said 
<laughs> but yeah, it's not generically amazing. Exactly. Somebody in chat, Okie Scoop. That's a good way of putting it. It's not generically amazing. I absolutely must play it. And I must play it if I'm in this color. I don't even I don't even think it's that. I don't I don't think it's that. I do think it'll get people to play green and standard again, which is good. <laughs> but you have to remember there's just not a whole lot of great green cards to play this around. And you have to play you have to be double green on three. Your deck has to be heavily committed to the worst color in standard to play this card. So that's also a downside, even if it's just like a 5% downside, it still counts as a downside. So I, I, I will go on record as saying the card is a B, but note again, one more time for the people in the back, I repeat myself too much. I really do, but I feel it's necessary when people in the comments are always, and I'm, I don't want to stress over them too much. I've been on YouTube for eight years, but people seem to hear what they want to hear. And people think that I just like hate cards or that I call a card like trash, you know, and like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I am not doing that. <laughs> so the card is good. I just, I don't think it's worth all of the sort of <laughs> attention is the kindest word to use. And freaking out is probably not the most polite term, but I've already used it. People are, are sounding the alarm about the card. And I don't, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's all that. It might be all that, but it's not a bag of chips. You know what I mean? So that's all I'm saying. Don't get don't get too hung up how good the card is. I think it's better than fine. I think it's better than fine, but not this amazing thing. I really don't. I can't believe you just said this card's trash. Yeah, thanks, Kane. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> There's people it's like unironically, dude. People will be in the comments like, "What do you hate, Renan?" Records good. People say all the same things I said. I guarantee you. People who who watch the whole runtime of the video will say stuff like, "You know, you can like play it on turn four and hold up cut down, so it's really good." Like people just say the exact same things I said and pretend I didn't say them. Like YouTube, YouTube comments get weird sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's all the spoilers from Mom that we got uh, over the weekend as I turn red. But I've been doing this for eight years. People do that. <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, that's all the spoilers. I love you, YouTube commenters. <laughs> love each and every one of you. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's it for mom. Um, they're trickling them out. It's not the official start of spoiler season, in case you wanted that question answered. I've already seen people ask it. Uh, still not the official start. It's not for a, a good little ways here, a few weeks. But they're trickling stuff out, and they said they might do that. You know. So here's what we got, and it's, it's good. It's a good card. <laughs> it's a good card, but... Anyway, uh, follow me on Twitch, uh, check out the Patreon, link in the description and on screen right now. And that's it, I'll catch you cats later, I'm Dev from The Place, thanks for watching Wizards, spread love and be kind YouTube, we'll see you later.